Hey guys, this is Lucid. Uh, I'm going to be doing uh, kind of a, a little bit of an after action review, uh, more of a um, nation overview 2.0. And uh, yeah, so first we're going to do the after action review part. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the last turn, or not the last turn, well the last turn I got to play, so I can still click on things, but I can't see the whole map of the scorecrafts. Um, so, uh, in, in terms of this game in general, uh, I, first of all, it was a ton of fun. Um, the, the pace, I think, uh, is pretty important for making, like, keeping the game fun for all the players. Um, and that was probably, I think, the, like, the least fun part of the game, was the pace. Um, and it, it gets to be, and I don't know if any of you have noticed this in your game, was that if you, once turns slow down to about, now, honestly, it's less than once a day, um, I found, just from experience. Like, uh, if it goes to, like, a turn every two days, then a lot of times the turns can start feeling like a chore. Um, there's a fun part that comes with having to do a turn every day, and then, uh, you know, when sink or swim, you're going to find out in, like, 24 hours. And I don't exactly know the psychology behind it, but... I know that while while games are going faster, less people stale, actually, which is the opposite of what you would expect. Um, and it's generally, I think, more fun. Like, if you lose, you're going to lose quickly. You know, you're going to lose over the course of, like, a week. You're not going to lose over the course of a month if it's taking, like, uh, three days per turn. Um, so I think that's an important thing. I think most people had fun, but I don't think they know how much fun they would have had if the game went faster. Um, and it was that reason, like, we didn't want the game, because I think at the beginning, uh, these guys have done this before, and they really didn't want the game to take, um, you know, to take half a year or something like that, which, if you go at one turn a week, is about how long it's going to take if the game goes late. So, um, and if you're, if you're in a losing position and it's going slow, you kind of want it to be over, or, you know, get kicked out or whatever. So... Uh, anyway, that was why the throne settings were how they were with kind of, we wanted it to be where we could throne rush. And, um, yeah, so that, that I think is the, the kind of first thing. Uh, it would have been, I think, more fun if we, if we went faster. But it, again, I'm only speaking for one of the players. Other people, um, have different time constraints where they can't put in, uh, you know, 30 minutes every day, which is, I think, kind of like a minimum for how much it would take. Uh, and then some people like Daz, uh, Daz does a ton of work on top of just playing the turn. So for him, each turn, you know, he's going to go update his war room, uh, which is really cool looking. Uh, and I think Daz puts in more time per turn thinking about it, um, which is really cool. I've watched almost all of his videos now because this is now done after the fact. Um, I've watched most, I think I've watched videos from all the players. I haven't watched every video from every player. Uh, but it's really fun. I went and watched almost all of Battle Misses, um, who was playing Ulm, of course. So it's kind of funny. Um, we kind of commented on each other's videos. But, um, yeah, so in terms of the speed, I wish it was faster. That's my number one thing. Uh, I think it would have been more fun for everyone. Um, I think we could have had less of a throne rush thing. The throne rush thing just, it's so much on RNG. And I think the one thing we could have done, which would have been fair, fairer for a throne rush, is, uh, taking some of the RNG out of it. Cause like throne rushes are already going to be RNG heavy, you know, where they spawn on the map and this, that, and the other, and uh, all of that. Uh, what we could have done, I think at a minimum, we should have probably taken the level 3 out and made, or just made the level 3 a level 2. Um, I think, in reality, what would have been a really fun game setting is if we did all level 2s, which we would have just been able to kind of like take the level 2s, because level 2s are kind of hard to take. So we would have just been able to take the level 2s kind of towards the end. Um, and have it where you need, like... I think if we had it where you need four level twos to win, which is kind of what we have it on now, like seven ascension points, I think that's okay. Uh, like four or five, depending on how much we wanted it to be a throne. That's still a throne rush game. Like with this many level twos and you only need four to win or five to win, like that's a throne rush game. I think it just would have been made the start locations a little more fair, which um, probably would have been fun. 
And the level two thrones, I think in general, are, are some of the most fun thrones. They have really cool bless effects, or they can let you get really cool units. So I think that's a really that would be a really fun uh, setting we could have done to change it. Um, yeah, I the so one of the other things too in terms of like an after action review. Now that I've watched everybody's videos, um, and this has to do with the throne settings also. Um, I okay, there's a few things. I, I think a lot of the players. I mean, not all while we were embroiled in the war, but um, like I, I think a lot of the players had much better throne awareness than I did. Certainly Daz had better throne awareness, and Midgard had excellent throne awareness, uh, who was played by Wade Star. Um, and I didn't really know how... I was kind of oblivious, because I was... I mean, A, there's not much I can do about thrones elsewhere in the map, and I can't really do anything. Like, this is my throne, this is my throne, and these this could be my throne. Like, this is my sphere of, influ of influence um, as a slow map move nation, and then maybe this one, if I'm willing to, like, raid from the ocean. Um, but my ocean-faring army, especially at the beginning, now I had, like, these guys who, you know, like, they're respectable. They could go on land and win a fight. Um, un unfortunately, there's probably not much I could do in terms of, like, water spells. I could bunch them up and cast Wave Warriors, which would not be bad. Um, and that could definitely, I mean, these guys would just destroy PD. They would kill a very small player army. Um, but, like, I don't think they could kill a medium Midgard army. And any place I go on shore would be a threat for them. If this was unforted, I could block a throne rush. I mean, but my sphere of influence was pretty small, especially at that point in the game when, when Midgard was going for a throne rush. I was, like, just barely getting uh, my my head into the water. Um, yeah. I the So I, I think kind of that's something I did pretty poorly, and if I had better throne awareness, I kind of tried to ask around a little bit, like, ask man which thrones these were. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, the other thing that was kind of weird for me is having the throne setting, like having such a throne rush focused setting, um, and having in-game only Diplo is a pretty interesting combination. Um, if I, I, th I don't, I'm not saying it was a bad combination. It was kind of cool. If I did it again... Um, you really have to be focused on it. I think that's a huge part of Diplo is knowing where the thrones are and how who has what. Um, like now my scouting network's okay. I can kind of see the important thrones that I'm going to need to see to kind of know what's going on. Uh, but before, like I, di I really didn't know about the Midgard throne rush. I was completely oblivious to it. Um, I didn't even really assess the threat that like, okay, here's a level three. And then like, I don't know what... I think I knew this was a level 1 and a level 2. Uh, just because he had claimed it. Sorry, I kind of just woke up. but um, And I knew he, he had this one too. So I guess I knew he was close. I, I don't know. It, I, it was just one of the things I think I was kind of lazy on. Um, I think in, it, it makes me realize, I think, how much in other games I really rely on other players' intel. Um, yeah. But... Uh, that is the thing when when you have um, out of game Diplo like you allow Steam or Discord, uh, you are you're force fed Intel. I mean you can't like other if somebody's worried about somebody else uh, and other things like they're gonna tell you the full situation. Um, and here it was in, in game only Diplo, and then it's like trying to decode Midgard messages too. So. Um, yeah, that, that that probably was not helpful for Intel that kind of, it, as it turns out, my main ally through the game, uh, Midgard, uh, was the least coherent uh, of all the players. And not in terms of, like, the player, but in terms of his character with uh, Viking language. So, um, those are the things. I think that the, one of the major, uh, one of the major issues for me, uh, this game was mobility. And being, if you're stuck at map move one, it is such a big constraint. Having venues where you can reinforce, like avenues where you can reinforce parts of your, of your kingdom are so important. So like if we look at the Jaguar, um, he is, uh, map move 14, which should mean in planes he can go, um, 
uh, he can go six. Uh, okay, no, but to go, okay. So to, to go, to go through a plane, okay, so let me make sure I got this right, sorry. Um, so to move, you have to pay twice, uh, which is, or you pay half of this twice. So if you go from a planes to a planes, you pay three and then three. Um, snow movement is plus two, so that kicks it up to eight and eight. I mean, uh, four and four. Uh, and so then if you want to make a second move in planes, so like two planes, you basically are going to have to move. You need 16. And we're under that. We only have 14. So... Uh, I'm not, I'm totally not sold now on, uh, on these cold scales. I think that's one thing. Uh, being map move one is just so bad. Now, some of these cartographic revisions maps end up having, like, up here, this is a mountain, even though it doesn't look like a mountain province. This is a forest and a mountain. Like, okay, this one's not. But it, it ends up having kind of a lot of these little mountains. And if you look at the movement cost for things, uh, the mountains are pretty shitty like 16 you just you know you you're going to pay eight like if you want to go from mountains to a plains you're going to pay uh 8 plus uh 3 if it's both warm um so that's 9 and then if you want to go on another plains it's going to be 6 so that's 15 and that's out of range of jaguar um so yeah, you can't you can't map move two through a mountain with jaguars is kind of the thing. These guys being low mobility is actually a problem. Uh, same with these guys. Uh, later you can become uh, if you're playing Micklin and you get into all the cool blood stuff, uh, or you get uh, your hero and you don't have them assassinated and you get air stuff, you can, uh, you know, you can do higher map move things, or you can use these guys. Uh, so like you have the devils leading around. Uh, a bunch of your Ozlottles. Um your your mages still are going to have some limited uh, mobility, um, but the the real hero, the real shining star of this nation, I think, is the uh, the turkey, which is obviously why I chose at the very beginning to have the turkey be my mascot. Um, these guys are the shit. I love these guys. I mean, when they all randomly sh showed up for this fight here with Ulm, like that was so huge. Um. And I don't know how it would have gone either way. I didn't do extensive playtesting or anything. But um, I know having a, like eight of these guys fly in and do wooden warriors and uh, swarm when I was outnumbered four to one was probably, or three to one, it was probably a huge effect. Uh, it was probably the difference between either me barely winning, like winning with like four guys left, and then like stomping him, which is what I needed to do in order to like take the rest of this stuff. So. Uh, these turkeys are the shit. Now, um, it's there. If you're fighting a pure cheap astral nation, they can uh, magic duel them, uh, and if they have really cheap S ones, then that's something you're vulnerable to. Uh, but if you're not worried about that, uh, these guys can fly in and they can do mass protection on any province once you have it. Like that's huge. It's so big, especially if you're not fighting a fire nation. Um, that means you can PD dump anywhere and have. Not exact shit. Um, meanwhile, you can also do it, so you put, uh, like a, uh, a reinvigoration item on them, which, I guess you'd have to do a nature one. Um, you can do a, a pearl, and then they do power of the spheres, and then they, oh, uh, that's not really gonna work. Okay, I think how this would actually work in practice, if you send three of them in, this would be like the, I'm spending a ton of resources to defend myself. Uh, you do two communion slaves, a communion master. One of them does power the spheres after that. Uh, then they do mass protection. Then they do personal regeneration. Um, and at this point, they are going to be nature four. Uh, and then later in the game, they can spam out charm, which is pretty cool, right? Or they can, or they'll, they'll also be astral, uh, astral three. So uh, that opens them up to doing Soul Slay and other sorts of things, which becomes much more effective when you're sitting behind Mass Protection PD Dump. Um, if that PD happens to be a fort because you moved and patrolled, um, then you're going to have Jaguars in there potentially, which are certainly going to be very appreciative of getting that. So these guys are awesome, I think. 
Um, and it's one of the things other players are like, hey, why didn't you get fire protection? Like, we don't have Abyssia or other things. Like, I, I, I remember Daz remarking on this several times in his videos when I went back through and watched them. And uh, at the beginning of the game, it did not help at all. But a lot of the key fights, uh, it actually made a big difference. Like, this, this last fight in Ulm, he had flaming arrows and was, like, pounding them into me. And if I'd done mass protection without fire resistance against flaming arrows... And he had, like, big... Ar if you remember, like, he had big archer contingents on the side. I mean, he had, like, 400 or 300 archers or something ridiculous, right? So there were a huge number of them. And they were spread out in clumps. And some of those clumps just sat there and just pounded bolts into my jaguars... Uh, for like 20 turns. Uh, if they had fire weakness and they got caught on fire, I mean, they would just be dead. It would have been a massacre. So, um, something like that in your bless, it only needs to pay off once. Or not really, but I mean, kind of. Like, losing, if I would have just gotten crushed there by Ulm, which is very possible that would have happened if I didn't have that. Um, assuming Chris Lighthawk still died. Then, yeah, it would have been... It would have been in trouble. And uh, the thing is, when you're going to rely on something, like, we are not a nation with Earth. Like, we have essentially no Earth. Um, when, you, when you're a nation that relies on something, like, okay, we need Earth. I mean, we, we need a protection buff, and this is the only one we've got. Um, you really need to take care of the weakness, because people get, will go out of their way to be like, oh, this guy's doing mass protection every single fight. Let's figure out some way to get fire damage. So taking a bit of fire resistance, I think, was actually pretty key. Um, in general, if we look at my bliss, I was pretty happy with it. Um, the uh, Obviously, I made a huge issue in the game, which I realized pretty freaking early, <laughs> that uh, Terminal 3 on Miklin is a problem because uh, you can't max out Jag production. Um, interestingly, it's something that uh, ends up correcting itself over time because the, the later the game goes the more uh, ocelotls are going to become an increasingly important part of your uh, your strategy. Um, and as that happens, you're less reliant on how many jags you can produce. Um, so I think there's I think the the bless I had was pretty good for a rush game. If I did a rush game again, I would just barely fix... Um, I can't dumpster my scales anymore, right? So I'd probably have to like give rid get rid of a tiny bit of my fire bliss. I could probably get rid of the attack or something. Uh because my guys are pretty killy. Um I and ultimately um the things that, that often you run into uh that are gonna keep you from killing is gonna be high protection. Like it's very unlikely sacreds get completely out, out like a Jaguar with blood surge uh is gonna get completely outclassed by um by defense. So the attack is definitely nice, but I think that's probably what I would get rid of to get a, a little better scales. And certainly I'd get rid of Dominion. I went Dominion 8 for some ungodly, unknowable reason. Thinking I was going to make like 8 jack. Now I did make 8. I mean, we, we were cranking the Eagle Warriors out. I mean, so this did the high Dominion did help with Eagle Warrior production. But uh, I would much rather have like 1 jack out of all my forts than like 2 extra Eagles in my capital. Um... It will slow down a little bit, your initial expansion, if you kill your Dominion some. <clears throat> but I think that's okay. Um, but, so anyway, you're, there's a few things you're balancing uh, when you design your Pretender in terms of short run versus medium. Um, the more you make it so you can recruit Jaguars, and the way you're going to recruit Jaguars is you need um, Dominion, and then you need uh, like Order. So the more you have, the more dominion you have, and the more order you have, theoretically, the more uh, you're going to be able to get out of each of your forts. Um, the the caveat to that is, if your fort is an enemy dominion, then, like, let's go check up here. Like here, we don't have sloth, and you can see we get significantly more jags. Like we get four, even though this isn't super high uh, in terms of. Uh, population, but if we look at another one, which is like the same population, but in my scale, so we get three, a three and a third, and here we get uh, four and three quarters. So we get a significant amount more. It really, it's like, because this would add up, this would be like another free one next turn. So this is probably going to be like, uh, like, it's almost, it, it's, it's like, 
fifty percent more, I think, uh, which is a lot. Um, it, you know, it doesn't sound like much because it just looks like one extra jag, but it's really like one and a half extra jags, uh, and one and a half when you're only making three, basically like three and a quarter, uh, is a lot. So uh, that's. But here we're outside of enemy dominion. So um, that's the other thing to balance is if you trash your scales. Um, you really don't want your land in your dominion, except if you decide to turn on the um, blood sacking utility, uh, which you usually only want to turn on if there's some horrible dominion effect. A lot of times, like if somebody has vengeful waters or something, it's too late. But um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that is a scary, scary thing about playing Micklin where you dump scales and you don't have dominion. Somebody casts vengeful waters and it's like, your entire territory is under that. Woo! Scary. Um, this there's a lot of real. Micklin is a weird nation to play. It's really weird. There, there's a few other spells which uh, are globals, which are gonna uh, rely on dominion, like dark skies and uh, wrath of God. And if if you're playing Micklin and you're letting other people's dominion be all your stuff, then you're in a bit of trouble. In fact, it's probably a big enough concern that even if you dumpster your scales, it's probably worth pushing them out um, tur around turn like 50, or maybe not that, maybe like turn 60. You're just like, okay, we're assuming turn 70, somebody's going to screw us with something. Like, let's start blasting it out here. Um, and you can do it selectively. You know, like you can be like, eh, these guys might do it. But anyway. Um, so... Uh, the, there's a few other things maybe just to reflect on. Um, I was pretty happy with the war with uh, Ulm. I knew that to have the war with Ulm work well, I would need, and this I think illustrates an important point to playing Dominions, um, I would need to have a significant army also defending, right? Because my army defend. I, I trusted man to let me reside here safely without having an army to defend myself. Um, almost none at all. Uh, and then Utgard, I probably trusted more to do it, but, I mean, I, I expected Na Man to follow his nap, but I don't expect he would have kept the nap very long if he saw zero sacred troops and that they were all running up to kill um, uh, Utgard, probably the same. Um, and there's nothing to make people make easy decisions like, hey, yeah, we were in a nap, let's keep it, like having a bunch of ocelotls, uh piled up in a fort. So... Uh, it does certainly make good allies. Um, but the important thing that I was going to say is that when I decided to engage in this war with Ulm, uh, and he had brought this big sacred doom stack, that um, to to fight this, I was going to have to use like half of my army to fight a hundred percent of his army, and so that's why having like some really cool surprise attack like I had here uh, ended up being really important because the odds were not necessarily even. Uh, I did have a really, you know, I had a really good bless, um, but Ulm is no slouch, like Ulm's no slouch, and he, uh, one thing I did not know, uh, and if you haven't seen it, you should go check out Battle Moose's channel, uh, he took uh, an awake blood fountain, and he was blood hunting, I think from almost turn, he did some research with it at the beginning, I think, but after that, I think he was just blood hunting with it constantly. Um, and the thing is, is that Sanguine Heritage, which is the spell uh, that Late Age Elm uses to get vampires, you can cast without any research. So I think he had his first vampire turn like six or something, which is so early. I was not expecting him to do it that early. Now it comes at a cost because you, you have to sack. Basically, you're going to lose like, uh, like three and a half scales for that. Um, but you're going to get your vampire economy going way sooner. Um, yeah, the, the only other kind of limit to going awake is often at the beginning of the game, you're limited by blood economy, by uh, how well you can patrol. And so I'm not sure if I like that build exactly, but he definitely got his vampire production economy going way faster than I thought. And that was one of the things I was surprised at when we were in war, is how quickly there were so many vampires. Um, so in, in, in some ways, I'm glad I went to war with him sooner. Because one of the things that it's kind of hard to, to do the calculus for and account for is that um, every time his vampires were out here annoying me, which was annoying, um, they were not in somewhere blood hunting. And um, letting, 
all scale so fast. Like, their vampires just multiply so quickly. So, uh, forcing him to use his vampires in combat rather than his blood hunters uh, is kind of a big deal. Um, so, I, th I think it was probably right for me to do that. And if you look at it, um, while at the time Ulm doesn't have any thrones, uh, he can definitely threaten, uh, like, a fair number of... Like, he can threaten this throne... Um, so, like, me having this one, like, if Ulm had a million, you know, by turn 40, if he wasn't fighting me and he was just preparing vampires for a vampire apocalypse on turn 40, you know, he would have had, I think he had 12 when we started fighting, you know, he would have had 30, probably, and so that would have been, like, 10 per throne for, like, this one and this one and this one, uh, or he could have 10 here, like, 10 vampires is a lot, you can put them in a communion, they can do some pretty nasty stuff. Um, I mean, they can just fill, especially when I have flyers going in and other things, they can just fill the world up with undead. So, probably was good to go after him. I mean, I could have gone after Utgard. Uh, the, the other thing, too, um, and, and Battle Moose messaged me a bit after the game, and we were talking about it, but, uh, you know, he said sorry for the, the backstabbiness and stuff, and I was like, yeah, I'm not upset in real life, I'm just upset in the game. Um, I like pretending to be upset, but... Um, it, his betrayal of me did affect Diplo. I mean, not only was I going this way because I wanted to get rid of the vampires, and it does kind of, you know, it gives me access to Pangea's throne at the last minute. Uh, it gives me access to this if I want to raid it. Um, I, I wasn't even really thinking about those things, to be honest, at the time. Um, the, the main thing was if I attacked anybody else, I really didn't trust him. Um, so, uh, and I wanted vengeance, in a way. So... Um, yeah, if, and, and my armies are so slow, especially with this cold dominion and being map move one, that if I committed to Utgard and he, you know, Utgard started crying to Ulm and Ulm's like, yeah, I, you know, I did hate Micklin after all. And he comes back and backstabs me. Like I can't, that would be it for me for the game. Like I'd be out and, and not even because Ulm would kill me, but because I would just have to move my troops back. And there's not many, I, I know it's going to be a short game. And I know if I have one thing where I march into somebody's land and I have to remarch an army back because there's like 400 archers and 200 heavy cavalry marching into my lands, like I knew if that happened one time, like I was out of the game. So having somewhat reliable allies that like at least wouldn't one turn backstab me, and I, I felt like man was in a position because he was fighting with Midgard, that I, I really didn't have to worry about this border. Uh, and then Utgard was in a position he really didn't have much to gain. He had one throne to gain, and then he would have to convince himself he would march in here. And I think with my bless, giants are not very good against it. So I didn't expect that. Um, underwater... I don't know. I think until you have Conjuration 5, you can't be a bully underwater because your underwater troops aren't great. Uh, unless you have chosen uh, for strategic reasons to, instead of making eagle warriors in your cap, to make uh, rain warriors. If you crank out a ton of rain warriors, you can potentially be aggressive in the water early. Otherwise, I think you're really waiting until you have a bunch of water mages um, plus Conjuration 5, because then you can do summon water power, and then you can do, uh, I mean, you can summon jade serpents, but uh, importantly, you can do uh, water elementals. Uh, underwater, and that allows you to be a bully, not against maybe a real underwater nation, but against somebody that was just kind of playing games at being underwater, like Pythium. Um, like, they're... What I would... I'm not totally sure how I would do this, because I don't really want my troops mixing it up with Pythium exactly. Um, so I'd have to figure out what I would do, because I don't really want these guys getting surrounded by Hydras. Ugh. Yeah, I'm not sure. Probably Thistle Mace plus some kind of, like, uh, Poison Resistance, which I think is... <sighs> I don't think I would have it anytime super soon. Where is it? Poison Ward? Yeah. Um, you, you need a Thistle Mace. So a Nature 1 plus a Thistle Mace, I'd be able to take the Hydras out underwater. Otherwise, I would probably try to fight provinces where Hydras weren't, and then just have my PD mostly do the heavy lifting on killing Hydras, like PD plus... Um... Water Elementals. Water Elementals should kill Hydras pretty efficiently, um, if you have enough of them. Um, but, 
Yeah, I think I was right to kind of like not be super aggressive in the water. There was a point at the end when Midgard was basically it ends with everybody that I could, because these armies were just sitting here, I could have stabbed them in the back and taken all this and this. The thing though was that was going to open me up to raiding from Midgard. Um, and it also would have given up any surprise I had if I decided to attack him. I mean, we had a, I think a, a nap one or something, or maybe we even had a nap three, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to go back and check, I don't remember. But uh, if we did have a nap, or like a, a short nap, it would open up surprise, he would move troops potentially to my into this theater more. Um, but if I were being strictly... He was also my only real ally, I think. Um, but if I were being strictly min-maxing, I think it was to the point where I probably should have attacked. I tend, I think I, I tend to bias myself a little bit. Like, Midgard was in no position to defend these lands, and if he ever wanted peace with me again, like, I could start raiding from this with the, the ocean forces. If he ever wanted peace, then I could totally settle for only taking the underwater and him keeping the islands so he can raid elsewhere. Or even I could have the islands, probably. So, uh, I... I think I was just kind of being nice by not attacking. Um, yeah. But he was my only ally, I think. So not totally sure about that. Um, and actually, we've gone really long now. So I think this is not going to be the national, national overview. I think this is only going to be the... Uh, uh, the... Uh, what do you call it? The after-action review. Um, some, I've read, uh, I'm doing this after, um, I posted the, the final video of, uh, you know, Unlikely Ascension. So I've read a lot of the comments too on Pythium winning. And, uh, I think some people had said like, I, I, cause I was a little salty in that. Um, and I'm a little, I mean, you can tell I'm like a tiny bit salty still. Just that the game, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually okay. Cause I got to do like a cool final battle that I tested, uh, and I, got to have some final moves. Uh, if other people didn't really know, like, man, I'm not sure how, if Daz knew that it was happening um, until the very end when he couldn't do anything about it. Um, but if I were that, you know, and I didn't even get to have my big final fight, I would be, I would be more salty than I am now. But it's possible these people are just better natured than me and they weren't salty at all. Um, like, but this would have been a cool final battle to see because Midgard had, you know, presumably cut off a lot of man's forces. Uh, and was going to have some final battle where if he won, there was going to be nowhere for man to retreat to. So I, you know, I totally wish some of these things uh, finished playing out. Um, but for Pythium to win, I mean, it's not a, I mean, getting, having two level th two thrones in the puddles were, I think, unfortunate for, for the game settings. But I mean, Pythium is not an underwater nation. They have the ability to forge manuals of water breathing and do foul vapors and stuff, which, you know, is great. Um, that, that gives them some ability to go underwater, but I mean, I am in underwater, I, you know, it would have been unfair if I spawned here, like, if, this would be a great spawning spot for me, by the way, I would have, like, cordoned myself off a nice zone, I couldn't have gotten ganged up on, uh, if I started right here, you know, like, I could have only gotten ganged up on by, like, one or two, by two, you know, I have, like, one defensive force here with a ton of PD and some sacreds and a fort, because I get sacreds in my, uh, in my fort. Or, like, here, depending on where the, the thing is. And then I have two neighbors. Like, this would have been an awesome starting spot. And then with aquatic units, I can just run over here. I would have totally been all about taking these thrones if I started here. Uh, but Pythium was not an aquatic nation. You know, they totally... Somebody... I think somebody said it right. Like, Pythium had their eyes on the prize. Uh, and they're they're playing a weak nation. And they, they had it just locked down. And they were overprepared. Like, look at this. Look at all these gladiators here. Nobody was going to march in and take this huge freaking throne with 250 gladiators inside. I mean, get out of here. You know, he, he was going to send little hydra bombs and foul vapors probably patrolling with a bunch of PD, which would just wreck whoever tries to send a big army in. Uh, and they wouldn't, you know, and that would be like the first line of defense, right? And then beneath that, if they went through the fort, I bet you he had like 200 gladiators. That throne wouldn't go in anywhere. Um... Which, at the end, it would have been nice for me to take it. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, 
Yeah, I you know I mean, it was it was a good move. It was a good move. I think it's a little unfortunate you can win with just three thrones. I think it would have been more fun if Pythium had to get a fourth throne, uh, like get this one. But uh, yeah, I mean he he had great game awareness apparently, knowing where all the thrones were, and he his Diplo too was awesome for it. Uh, you know, he was saying he was getting this throne to stop Satis, which everybody was worried about Satis getting thrones, because Satis had this one and this one, and uh, he was kind of winning the war, it seemed, with Pangea, except Pangea may... I kept seeing in man's videos, but I don't remember actually watching it, like seeing this part, but apparently Satis's cap had... Where the hell is Satis's cap? I can't remember. Here it is. That it had a Pangean army on it? Which I'm not sure about, but I, and maybe it was still the case. I have no idea. Um, but yeah, Satis was in a position to have that throne, and which is this Utgard throne, and then this throne, and then this throne, and then this throne, and then this throne. Like, I think Man had this one, but Satis potentially could take it. Satis also was around a lot of the high value thrones, so people were really worried about him. Pythium did a good job. Nobody, I don't think he was really, like, maybe Man sent me one message saying, hey, we have to be a little worried about Pythium because he got this one, and if he gets more, he can win. Uh, but and but he he snuck this one in. It was, it was just well done. Um, I think Throne Rushes are way easier in no out-of-game Diplo games, though. So there were a lot of things we did that made Throne Rushing easier. I mean, not only the settings we put the game on, uh, but also having no out-of-game Diplo makes it very, very hard to coordinate uh, on a throne rush. Um, like, for example, just at a minimum, because uh, I think what actually ended up happening in this game, and go check out uh, Squanny's videos uh, to see for sure, because I, I don't think he's... Po at the time I'm recording this, I don't think he's posted his final ones yet, so I can't see, but uh, I've talked with him, and this throne he was going to take... He forgot to put Flesh Eaters on his guys, and he's pretty sure that he would have won if he had Flesh Eaters on them. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, like, I, we would have been talking about that in Discord or something if it were a normal game. Be like, oh my god, there's a Throne Rush, what are we going to do? And he'll be like, oh, I'm attacking here, and I'll be like, oh, are you putting Flesh Eaters on? And he's like, yeah. Uh, even though we would have been in fighting, we probably still would have been talking. So, um, we also would have sorted this out, like, I... If he saw my army, that turn he saw my army move up one turn too soon, he would have been like, hey, dude, uh, you're breaking. You're, it looks like you're about to attack me uh, one turn too early. And I'd been like, oh, shit. And then I just would have sat here. But once I was on top of this and he had assassins and stuff and infernal disease, I was like, okay, we got to go for it. Uh, which is true, because if he got one more infernal disease or one more assassination off and he got my ranking, this whole army was dead. So, um, yeah. Like, he killed this guy at the last minute, This like, this turn, because the last turn I submitted. This guy got killed, right? So he wasn't there that fight. If they got my ranking, whew, been in trouble. Would not have been good. Um, and this guy has no armor, so uh, I was kind of being a cheap bet. There were some things, like, if we look at my gems, um, I probably could have, you know, I, I should have been putting armor and stuff on my guys, I think. Like, especially for this fight. I, I did for some of the important guys coming up here, like for the fight with Ulm, but I probably, for some of my important Divine be Blessing type things, I should have been putting uh, different items on them to make them a little more survivable, um, or giving them Rings of... Per uh, rings of oh, I can't do Rings of Warning because I don't have air. Um, anyway. Um, I think that's it for my, for my After Action review. Um, I think it was a fun game. Uh, I wish I used the Steel Levens better. There are a bunch of things. I think I would play Miklin significantly better if I played them again. Uh, but I think a lot of that uh, we're going to talk about in this... I guess we're going to have a final final episode where I'm going to do a National Overview 2.0. So I'll see you guys uh, probably in the next day because I'm kind of just binge uploading these right now. All right, see ya.